five minutes later. Good morning, good evening, or good afternoon, depending on where and when you're watching this broadcast. I'm still Thomas Fessler, and this is still Disclosure Tonight. Happy freaking Wednesday, everybody. It's hump day. It's that day of the week, down to the hour, minute, and second. We come together, unlike a couple other podcasts out there, to go ahead and talk about those things that the government doesn't want to admit, to talk about those things. Well, you know, from science fiction and talk about those things, well... Of course, from the X-Files, what things are we talking about? We're talking about the things that you can go off and see in the sky in the evenings, but some nights you just need to go outside and look up. What are we talking about, friends? We're talking about good old-fashioned UFOs here on Disclosure tonight. We still call them that for a good reason. Why? Because there's a word for it in every single language around the world throughout perpetuity. Who in the heck knew? So as our federal government continues their 77-year war against the extraterrestrial presence, how do we know, friends? Oh, just take a look. It's a military operation. Whether it's the Navy chasing him through the air and under the sea, or it's the Air Force chasing him through the air to figure out where they crashed, to pull out the survivors for testing their DNA against ours, and to use their technology for our weapons of mass destruction. That's why we come together many nights a week, folks, and tonight is no substitute. We've got a great show tonight. Still uh, delving into the Saul Conference, as well as talking about some breaking news about ufos and national security who would who would have thought yeah there's a lot of stuff going on and we're going to keep you up to date as we usually do on disclosure tight you know why because we can't continue to wait for those idiots in the white house to tell us the truth because they're covering up along with those bozos in the dod who work for those idiots in the white house that's why you'll be joining myself thomas fessler all of our friends in the back and everybody in the chat for yet another episode of disclosure tonight good evening everybody wow it feels like the first time i've gotten that right <laughs> and what seems like too long yeah getting my game back how about that on that note yeah we've got a great conversation tonight gary nolan yes coming out of the soul conference coverage we've been doing here on disclosure tonight we're going to be talking about gary nolan and you know his presentation at Saul. more importantly getting into the details of his ufo fragment test results yes he's done some un unbelievable analysis and we've got lee here in the back can't wait to see what kind of uh in great information we pull out of there in the meantime it's go it's time to go ahead and welcome in our audience let's go ahead and do that where are the drums let's get them up and going all right here we go let's go ahead and welcome everybody and who do we have out there well i gotta bring that up on the big screen so i can see what's going on let's go and welcome in our audience who in the heck is out there let's take a look well if you look at this we have abby Araxa. welcome my friend andrew davies andrew donnelly anthony mac after death the original mr good lookings here aubrey mcleod along with chameleon uk the charles kerr is here the charles kerr welcome charles good to see you around my friend cr's here crash retrieval maybe carriage return could be destiny rocks donald harris is around along with eli mcginnis evan b firefly frostradamus Welcome. I'm Th I'm Nostra Thomas. Good to see you, my friend. What kind of predictions do you have for us today? Jan's here. Jan, thank you for sending that UFO video. Interesting. It's hard to tell what it was. Kind of hanging out there in space, but turn that over on the Twitter sphere. Uh, oh, formerly known X, formerly known as Twitter, I should say. J Cats here. Jennifer. Jonathan Horvat. Kathy. Kelly Brotner. Piercing blue eyes. Good to see you, Kelly. Always wonderful having you out in the chat. Cosmos Galacticus here along with Ro Lee Rose. Littles around along with Lewis Brown. Mac Guffin made it in. Uh, Melissa Hogan is also here along with Mr. Catfish 2100. Yerpity yerp yerp. Mick Mick made it in along with a man from a state that's called Borgen, but he's certainly not born. Boring. Uh, Neil Carr, thanks for coming in, my friend. N Niles Guy is here along with Paul DeMond. Peggy with Crockett and Tubbs and Steve, thank you for that wonderful uh, Valentine's Day wishes to me, Luke, and the puppies. Absolutely. I hope you 
and Steve have had a beautiful romantic day as well. Uh, who else do we have out there? We've got Pete Liebel made it in, along with Rachel Osborne, Rainbow, also known as Jane, resonates here. Shelly Montgomery, the Shelly, our very own Shelly Montgomery, is in the chat, and she's in the back. Can't wait to see what Shelly brings up today. Stargazer, 46 and 2, is here, along with Terrence Wills. Thor Panku, a man with 33 years of, of experience of researching MJ-12 including in Washington, D.C., and the National Archives. Let's welcome into our chat Mr. Thomas Whitmore. Why, oh, why fools made it in along with Wildcat Mahone and the YouTube ufologist. Welcome in, YouTube ufologist, my friend. Hopefully we've got a great show for you. Let me close the door. I've got a husky having an argument upstairs. <laughs> Interesting to say the least. On that note, let's go ahead and just take take double take a check here let's go ahead my, my friends it's time to welcome in our friends in the back let's go ahead and see who we have back there well it's a man who's usually at the front of the line and like no other he's there again let's welcome in our very own brian pemble how's it going brian hey it's going good thomas uh happy valentine's day and hump day on the same day for everybody. absolutely thank you for coming in my friend did you get anything special for the uh mrs pemble you know, all of our money goes to the kids' uh, school. So we, the wife and I, have agreed that we're just going to lay low and do a little something special um, yeah. that I can't, can't talk about on the show. How about that? Oh, yeah. Always take care of yourself first because if you don't take care of yourself, you can't take care of anyone else. That's right. Yeah, that's yeah, right. Absolutely. Thanks for coming in, Brian. Wonderful having you here. Also, the man who has an answer for everything. Who never forgets anything. Let's welcome in our very own Lee. Uh, Lee, uh, Lee, how's it going, Lee? No, it's okay. Uh, we're doing good. I don't have an answer for everything, but um, I like to think I do. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm glad to hear you've gotten over your explosive uh, bout with the coof. <laughs> yeah, the COVID was uh, very strong on the dark side this time around. Oh, yeah. I have never coated a toilet bowl like when I've had COVID. <laughs> That sounds like you got the same the same treatment. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't uh, it it doesn't pair around and uh, and take friends. It just takes everybody down. Exactly. Well, glad to see you're feeling better and welcome back for tonight's show again, my friend. Thank you for pushing through it. Also in the back, we've got a man coming from the country where all the use are silent. Let's welcome in our very own Michael Sekloff. How's it going, Michael? Good, Thomas. I, uh, I hear it's going to be a very hypersonic show. It could be hypersonic. It could be nuclear. It also could be unidentified. You never know where this is going to go. You never know. Ooh -hoo. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks for coming to Michael. Also in the back, we've got our very own. She's going to let you have it. It's very own Ms. Cussout. How's it going, Ms. Cussout? It's going great. How are you, Thomas? Uh, see you, see. Come see, come see. Uh, neck this morning, horrible. When I got up this morning at 5, and it was like I tried to get ready and just kept on getting worse. Went to lay back down, sent an email to boss. I'm out sick today. Feeling a little bit better now. I'm not sure if we'll do a whole full show tonight, but you know what? I'm here for a bit because we've got stuff we got to cover. It's been one heck of a bang-up day, I tell you. Also, thank you for coming in again, Miss Cussout. Appreciate you being here. Thank you. Also in the back, we've got our very own Neil Carr. How's it going, Neil? Uh, it's going good, Thomas. Uh, oh, it's a pleasure to be here. Hello, everyone. Welcome, my friend. Great having you here also. Well, in the back, we uh, he's known as Reality Check up on the board. He's our very own Hollywood Herald. How's it going, Harold? It's going pretty good, Thomas. Uh, I've just been immersed in these uh, lectures over the past couple of days here. There's some good stuff in there. Yeah, Can't isn't it? Some amazing stuff, at, to say the least. It's it's looking for those little nuggets along the way that keeps us all going, I think. Thank you for coming in today, yep. uh, Harold. Also in the back, we've got our very own Shelly Montgomery. How's it going, Shelly? Hey, Thomas. Hi, crew. Um, it's going good. Happy Valentine's Day, everybody. Can't wait to uh, dig into this. You better believe it. Well, and this uh, brings us back to our, our dear lady friend from the East Coast, from New York, I think. Let's very welcome in our own Tia Maria Loreno. How's it going, Tia? Oh, it's going good. Going good. Happy Valentine's Day, Thomas. Have you survived? <laughs> oh, God. I can't wait for it to be over, to be quite <laughs> frank. 
but I I can't wait till after the show so we can get the details. <laughs> The best thing to do, don't cry, don't get angry, just laugh. It'd be yes, one of those things like, you did what? Ah! Or like, <laughs> you did what? It's yep. just so much easier. And people, you know, it's better than, get, you know, people, are you laughing at me? Yes, but I'm not getting angry at you, which, trust me, you wouldn't like me when I'm angry. I, th I have a feeling you'd be the same. Yep. <laughs> don't upset her. Thank you for coming in. Uh, appreciate you coming around. And then Matt, well, from a man who was offline earlier today, but he's back with us now, and he survived almost Valentine's Day. Let's welcome in our very own Mike Disclosure. How's it going, Mike? Oh, must be something in the air tonight going around for Valentine's Day. Interesting. One of those uh, times of the year, I guess. Um Happy Valentine's Day to everybody in the audience. Uh, I wish everybody the best. And um, it seems like we're going to have very interesting things to talk about tonight. Should yeah, be fun. It is. It is. And hopefully it is a bloody Valentine, but you never know. <laughs> well, could be. You never could know. be. The day's not Possibly. Over. Not over yet. Not you never know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. But hey, it's you only got three hours, not two hours and 45 minutes until it's over or less. <laughs> I can't but, wait. But then again, a woman never forgets. <laughs> oh, God, no. Unfortunately, <laughs> that's true. Never ends either. not getting my little dog on that note let's get into this now if we can uh let's see what's going on with the audience hope everything is going fine there let's go ahead and get the auto chat up and going so interesting day to say the least i guess we could start this off kind of mike with a breaking ufo ufos alert there's some interesting Absolutely. things that have gone on today where do we start well if you remember last week we covered chris leto over on twitter I mean, he has, he had a YouTube channel, emphasize the word had, uh, and he had an adventure with some edibles, <laughs> edible psychedelics, well, uh, mushrooms kind of. and yeah. various drugs. Yep. Yeah. Ask his wife. Yeah. Yeah. And unfortunately, coming out of that, uh, the result is Chris Lettle has stepped away from the world of UFO disclosure. He's done. Imagine that. Imagine, Imagine that. that. Everyone said he too. was going to be fine, that he was saying he was going to be fine, but it looks like he's gotten he's a little fine. deep in there. So He's obviously not fine. No, he's not. He's not trying. Oh, there's an interesting one. I need to throw that in there. Yeah, it's one of those things that's there. But it's. I think it's kind of catchy, though, Mike, because not only is Chris Leto stepping away, so is Alien Girl 111. She's done. Oh, wow. Yeah. Must be something in the air. It's got to it be something around. in the air. It's got to be something in the air. Not quite sure what it is. But uh, coming from oh, our friends over at Fox News, or bring this up for a second here, uh, just a little clip here. We can get into the details on it. Uh, a Pentagon source confirmed the threat is related to space. What am I talking about? Well, let's bring up the desktop video for a second. Yes, Mike Turner announces there is a serious national security threat that the president needs to declassify for everyone. But the way they talk about it, though, Mike, is, you know, this could go either way. If I can get to my bookmarks and I can bring up the actual story itself, I'll bookmark. Actually, I've got it right here. Starting off uh, today, uh, coming from Newsweek earlier today, a cryptic national security threat sparks UFO theory. A cryptic statement warning of a possible, quote, serious national security threat, unquote, on Wednesday sparked many social media users to speculate that it's related to UFOs. You never know what it's going to be until we get the truth on this one. So I'm not going to throw out the UFO with the baby and the bathwater, I tell you. A, um, in a statement, House Intelligence Committee Chairman Mike Turner today said, quote, Today, the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence has made available to all members of Congress information concerning a serious national security threat, end quote. 
Next quote. I am requesting that President Biden declassify all information re- relating to this threat so that Congress, the administration, and our allies can openly discuss the actions necessary to respond to this threat, Turner added in a statement. Now, uh, a, a user on X wrote, it's definitely aliens, sharing a gif of an alien. Ex-user Chuck Harrison said, speculation is running the national security threat. Could be UFO-related. If so, Turner is vague about it. If it's UFO-related, especially with the UAP hearings going on. Well, they're not going on. We haven't had them in a while. But if I bring up a good old picture of uh, Mike Turner and, and a quote here coming from the UFO, Joe. Let's zoom in to the video. Here we go. However, ex-user the UFO Joe said, he, you follow the UFO Joe, don't you, Mike? <laughs> it's been a while yeah said i know folks want this to be about ufos but there's nothing that suggests that to be the case watch out for f- folks saying otherwise well the truth of the matter is the answer of what's going on is still not out there it could be related to russia it could be related to something else i know if i go into my bookmarks here i think i may have just added something on here oh yes However, in a recent tweet uh, eight hours ago after this happened, Tim Burchett let out, the, let out saying that Iran is moving toward nuclear weapons and this administration is helping fund it indirectly. I tried to find out how and why. Let's, uh, let me go ahead and bring this up. Let me get my other browser up here to do it so everyone can hear this one. One second. One second. All right, let me bring up the video here of Tim Burchett, and I bring it up for us all to go ahead and see on the on the Jumbotron that we've got set up here. All right, here we go. we got a tweet coming from Tim Burchett talking about this with the quote that I just said. Let's see what Tim had to say on his X profile earlier today. Burchett was leaving Foreign Affairs um, Committee. We had an interesting... Um, dialogue I did over the um, if the Iranians were close to developing nuclear weapons and um, apparently they are getting getting closer they have uh, done some things in, in the past and here again we're we freed up um, this, the Biden administration has, has uh, taken all the the uh, restraints against their oil production and their billions of dollars of of profits and they're using that to fund their nuclear arsenal and that is a very dangerous proposition so we'll see what the administration is going to do about it other than enable them just beyond me right they're not compromised Here's one thing. It may not be Iran because Iran doesn't necessarily have the best space program. Mike, wasn't it leaked out that said this has to deal with something in space? It could possibly be Russia and nukes? Yeah, it was um, CNN that earlier today that was specifically talking about that. Um, they had made a point that right now, the Ukraine uh, was attacked by a 3M22 Zircon uh, super uh, hypersonic missile. Uh, this hypersonic missile can invade Western missile defense systems. Um, so Representative Mike Turner is sounding the alarm bells. They seem to have been deploying it, uh, and it utilizes uh, low Earth orbit, which is how it's able to strike anywhere on the planet uh yeah so they this is what they were talking about as far as what tim burchett mentioned that this is about iran possibly developing nuclear weapons that's been going on for decades already it's nothing new about that and certainly not alarming um so i don't know why he was making those points it doesn't add up to me or what was reported earlier from cnn it's strange I know they're having meetings in Washington for the next two days about this. I'm curious to see as we progress uh, in the next day or two, what's going to come out? Because I think a lot of this is still 
up in the air. But it's interesting. It's all very interesting. This is this could be going in a direction that may lead to possibly World War Three. I'll tell you this: if it is Iran and they did produce nuclear weapons, right now we're kind of in a major conflict with them because it isn't just Iran isolated as a foreign adversary. They basically have, by proxy, control over Syria and a lot of the areas like Lebanon and that Israel is in a conflict with, and by proxy, so are we. That's almost like close to being a world war. If well, we if you look at it as well, Iran that, even has uh, outposts going in Iraq at this at this time. Yes, that's correct. So if it, it doesn't really matter at this point that if we go to war officially with Iran or Russia, it's the same. We're in the same boat. Same equal threat on either side. Yeah, absolutely. I want to go ahead and just uh, thank uh, Faze Will just threw us a super chat. Uh, I want to thank uh, Faze Will for that wonderful super chat. Let me go ahead and get this up. Yes, I'm Faze Will. I'll be right there with you, Nick. Hold on. Uh, Faze will just start off tonight's Super Chats right now for a $10 Super Chat. UFOs are coming. Like, subscribe, and share. Yes, for the person who was complaining that I was saying every every five minutes to go ahead, like, subscribe, and share. No, we don't do it every five minutes. We do it a couple times through our episode. And may other people in the chat may say the same thing because they're encouraging you to do it. go ahead and give us a thumbs up or a thumbs down. We'll take one or the other. More importantly, if you haven't subscribed, do us a favor. Hit that subscribe button. We would love to have you as a regular hand disclosure tonight you know we're less than uh oh so less than 700 subs at this point to hit that magic number of 8,000. so do us a favor be one of those numbers be one of that 700 to help us get to that a magic number of 8,000 subs and we're only going to get there with help from people like you even the guy who complained about it but you know what he subscribed because he actually put comments up on youtube so thank you very much sir appreciate your subscription on that note we have a couple people in the back with their hands up first let's uh first get to uh syrup and then we'll get to nick syrup go ahead yeah, real quick. My question is, uh, if it was Russia and what Mike was talking about, what is it that they would need to declassify? Wouldn't Congress already be up on, uh, wouldn't Congress already know about this? Wouldn't this be something that Congress and everyone should already kind of know about? What is it that they're, what would they need to declassify is my question. I don't know. Well, there's something going on that's that's been classified at the highest level at the executive branch. No one in Congress has been aware of this, except now there's some people in the uh, the head of the Arms and Services Committee, uh, uh, Mike Turner. Um, well, whichever committee, I was probably wrong on the one he was on. Mike Turner is bringing it up that he's going to start declassifying information in Congress, and people have been marching into and out of the skiff in this, uh, the Senate-controlled skiff all day today. So we're going to have, actually not the Senate, the House-controlled skiff all day today to see where this is going to go. Okay, got you. Yeah. Well, Absolutely, to follow up on that real quick, let, let me jump in for a second. It's not just a question that Russia can fire hypersonic missiles that can't be stopped by a missile defense system anywhere on Earth. The other thing that considers that involves space is that Russia was considering launching these hypersonic missiles into space with a nuclear warhead. And what they wanted to do is detonate the nuclear warhead to take out our satellites, which would affect GPS and communications and Internet and all the things that would probably put us back into a, the Stone Age for a while. Mike, if you were to go to ahead and it. launch and blow off a uh, nuclear a missile over the United States, you would create an EMP pulse that would wipe out all the electronics in our country, not just our satellites, but it would be a detriment that would damage our infrastructure of our country. Oh, hugely, but that's not what Russia is proposing. They're trying to and have a nuclear missile detonate to wipe out our satellites that are in orbit. Bob, what I'm Not saying, Mike, is the if, they, if they blow off a nuke to take out our satellites for GPS, which are geostationary over the United States, that will result in an EMP pulse that not only will the UFOs fall out of the air like a lead weight, but also it will 
create that EMP pulse that will not just take out our satellites, it's going to take mm -hmm. off, take out infrastructure in our country. If it was over the continental United right. States. Right. And if they're going to take out the United States critical satellite infrastructure like GPS and other stuff, that means they're blowing it off over our country. And that would be an act of war, right? Oh, heck yeah. <laughs> what do you think? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I just wanted to make sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. If we can, Nick, you've um, had your hand up, my friend. Yes. Um, like, do you believe that these technologies, such as the um, like hypothetical space nuclear weapons and the and the hypersonic missiles, uh, uh, like, do you believe that it comes from UAP, like reverse? No, hell no. If we're it, no hypersonic has nothing to do with UFOs. That's just fast acceleration, uh, a like, fast rocket being able like, to go ahead and get to those particular these points. Technologies come from reverse engineered no, UAP technology. No, not at all. Hyperson mm -hmm. Hypersonic is a propulsion-based technology. If you look at everything that's going on with UFOs, Nick, we're dealing with something that ha that's affecting gravity and warping reality around it, allowing it to basically slow down our reality to standing still where their ships are moving around at full speed and they are mo moving around with impunity. A hypersonic missile is just basically a still a standard propulsion missile that we've figured out ways to get to go really, really fast. Does that sound right? Rightly. Yeah, that's exactly right. But it is it, it is um, current modern tech as yeah. far as I say this because the the uh, United States not, government not, like they don't even not, have the, the technology that Russia has at the moment. Actually, yeah, but Nick, it's not it's not UAP tech that they're talking about. It's no. it's these aren't these aren't physics that uh, defy our understanding of of uh, our our you know third dimension reality of physics. Like, do you believe? That they got some help from UAP technology? No. Oh, no. Hypersonics? No. Okay. It's I just agree. a really, all it is is a really fast, very aerodynamic Ooh. rocket that they figured out how to make move really fast. Brian, I think you, some of your family members may have some experience in this. Do you want to enlighten us? What's that, moving really fast? <laughs> um, Hypersonic no, um, missiles. Yeah, right. no, um, what I would like to say on that, as far as uh, detonating a nuclear warhead um, in space, you know, if we can relate it to the UFO topic, remember when we even tried to put a dummy warhead up there, supposedly that was shot down. So I think that might be, I mean, I'm not rooting for anybody to put that in there, but that might be uh, something to watch for. Yeah. Because as Absolutely. far as I know, we're the only ones that have tried to put a, a nuke or even a dummy nuke in space. I wouldn't doubt that. I mean, if you go back to stuff that was going on back in the uh, Star Wars days, the as uh, the SDI initiative that was going on back in the 80s, I believe. Back in that time, there was talk of nuclear weapons going up in space. So the ability to have nuclear uh, warheads up on satellites has been an option on the table for probably a good 30 years, if not longer. Um, Lee, you have your hand up. I, w I wanted to ask Mike and and the audience and everybody that's involved. I think the timing of this is very um, contrite and uh, almost forced. It wasn't just until you know Sunday or Monday that Carl Nell came out with his you know Saul uh, Foundation um, thirty minute clip, and he spoke specifically about the Gang of Eight being read in to everything. And uh, he went further even to say that um, the National Security Council is also aware. And that he also hypothesized that the DNI or the ODNI is involved in this as well. And then three days after that hits, now granted that happened months ago, but as soon as this hits and everybody's listening to it, we get a conversation about a national security threat that involves the Gang of Eight come out of the house. We get Jake Sullivan come from the NSC council um, talking about uh, Turner's conversation that he had this afternoon. And well, I'm wait, wait, hold on a second. Wasn't Jake Sullivan the guy that Biden put, well, the Biden administration, not Biden, but the Biden administration put on point to investigate UFOs a year ago? That's right. Yes, it was. That's yep. right. So now, so now we have two, we have two hmm. cornerstones of what Carl Nell was talking about. And I'm wondering when the ODNI is going to get involved in this conversation. And the timing of this just seems too ripe for this to be happening at this point. So. I just find it very interesting that Carl Nell spoke about these things once it was released, and now we have two out of the three big players that he was talking about that know everything 
um, all of a sudden you're talking about a national security threat coming from Russia in space. There's just something very odd and very off about this as far as the timing, in my opinion. Yeah, it is. Baba 200 brings up and says, let's talk about the satellites Russia has that have the ability to move and take pictures of our satellites, too. It's not just Russia. China has been also launching satellites up into orbit that can that are going and following along with our uh, satellites, moving into and out of orbit and doing direct observations. So we have both China and Russia going ahead and having covert satellites that... Uh, aren't just up there specifically to communicate down with Earth. They're up there for military reasons. That's why one of the big reasons that they say is the next frontier of our battlefield. That's why Space Force is so is, is, is so important because it's our up, upper atmosphere and beyond. Brian, you have your hand up. Yeah, if I could add one political uh, wrinkle to Lee's uh, comment there too. Um, they had the uh, funding for Ukraine pass in the Senate and the Speaker of the House, Mike Johnson, is not going to be bringing it up. And so that's also the interesting timing that 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 Ukraine funding bill is not going to be brought up in the House. It's not going to pass. And now, you know, perhaps this is just a theory. Are they creating a threat to try and get that passed? That, yeah. That's another option. True, true. That's true. actually a yeah, very good point, Brian. Uh, it might be something to that. I guess we're going to have to wait and see how it plays out. But that very well could be exactly what this is all about. Good observation. Could, could you repeat that? I'm sorry, man. It, my phone cut out. What did Brian say exactly? Um, yeah, there Brian was a um, yeah, there was a Ukraine funding bill. We, you know, we've been uh, monetarily uh, back in the war um, as well as uh, weapons deliveries. Um, the Senate had passed a new Ukraine completely separate. So there's no border deal, no nothing, purely Ukraine funding. And and the Speaker of the House, Mike Johnson, says he's not even going to bring it to the floor. Um, so, it, you know, we're not fans of Mike Turner here. I think everybody can probably say that uh, as far as uh, disclosure goes. Um, you know, could they be bringing up a security threat in order to get that passed in the House to get it brought to the floor? That's a possibility, too. That's just one of the, the areas of timing that is a little suspicious. Right. OK, got you. Thanks for that. Yeah, it's an interesting piece, to say the least. I've got, you know, talking about the things that are going on in space right now. I've got an interesting clip here coming cool. from the Space Force Senate hearing back in late, uh, April 11th, 2019, talking about the threats in space uh, and, and the need for Space Force. Let me go ahead and bring this one up here, desktop video. I should be able to show this one. Let's kick this off. Here we go. The most important facts for us and the American people to understand are the facts that haven't been said today. And the reason why they haven't been said is that they are largely classified. And the reason that's important is that the American people have no idea, really no idea, about the immensity of the threat in space. And I've made this comment in a classified setting that I wish the American people could be present in this room, not this room, but the SCIF, because our adversaries know what they are doing. We know what they are doing. They know we know what they are doing. But the American people have no idea. And so this discussion and debate will have very little interest in the American public. It's carried on in a level of, forgive me, bureaucratic language. Lee, you have your hand up? This is exactly what Grush talked about. Um, when he talked about foreign intelligence that came to him that gave him the names of the programs that um, caught his attention where they said, we're, we're aware of what your own government won't even disclose between national security measures with your, your own agencies, that there were his counterparts, his, uh, you know, he, he spoke about this, that his, um, his adversarial counterparts were telling him 
the names of the programs. And he ran with that and started researching it. This is what we're talking about here. Our adversaries know what we know. We know what they know. Um, if you could replay what he just said, it's it sounds like gibber jabber. How, much, how, how far do you want to go back? Uh, just maybe like 15 seconds into it when he was talking about they know what we know. And it's a running joke, right? They know what we know. We know what they know. Well, it we comes down to I think we know what they know, but they don't know what we know because if they knew what we know, then they would be acting differently. <laughs> right. But but Grush did talk about this and yeah. he brought it to attention in, in the hearing that um, it has been brought to his attention by foreign counterparts and in intelligence that are our adversaries that are aware of the programs that we do not disclose between Congress, the executive branch and the public. Yeah. Good points. Let's go ahead and listen in on that. I rewound a little bit. Let's see where we're back again. Here we go. will have very little interest in the American public. It's carried on in a level of, forgive me, bureaucratic language that most Americans would have trouble seeing an immediacy in their daily lives. But if they were privy to what we hear, and you know it much better than we do, because you live it, I think they'd be pretty alarmed. Uh, and uh, this is not by way of criticism of you because you're living with the strictures of what is classified and not. But uh, I think we have a, a real obligation to explain to the American people why space is a domain that matters, why the threats there are real, and urgent why they are growing in importance. There you go. Bruce, Bruce, the you have your hand up on this one. Go ahead. <clears throat> uh, yeah. So there's another piece to this puzzle. SpaceX launched uh, a missile five days ago that was classified. You can't find much about it. And then something was launched today by SpaceX that was also classified. They're not secret. launching missiles. They're launching rockets and they're launching satellites. Okay, well, they're launching something. It was unplanned. It seems like it was emergency done, like they're trying to react to something. Um, and there's very little talk about it. And I think it's related to all this talk that needs to go on in Congress. That Jake Sullivan guy who gave the briefing today was surprised that Turner said anything because he's going to the House tomorrow to talk to the four people in the Gang of Eight for the House about this classified problem. Right. So he didn't want to talk too much about it today, but he seemed very shocked that Turner said something when he's going to go to the House yeah. tomorrow and talk to them about this emergency situation. Right. Well, clearly it's an evolving situation, and Mike Turner thought it was important enough to get his name out there in front of everybody else and drop the bomb, the truth bomb, on the American people saying, hey, we've got a big problem here, and I'm glad he's doing that. So let's take a quick look at that for a second. Mike Turner is in the pocket of the military-industrial complex, right? And if it turns out that the funding for the Ukraine effort and money going to Ukraine from the United States, where is that money going to end up? Directly in the military industrial complex. They're going to be buying weapons. And that then goes back into Mike Turner's pocket. So there might be, like Brian pointed out, a reason why he's sounding the alarm on this. Yeah. Bingo. You hit it. You nailed it on the head. And Brian, if you don't mind, talk more about it. That's This is exactly the timing of what smells exactly what my... Okay. Uh, talking about Jake Sullivan, I do have the clip of Jake Sullivan at today's White House press conference. Let me go ahead and bring that up just to clarify for everybody what Jake Sullivan said on this. We've got, we've got a little bit more time to get to this, but we are going to have to get to the story about Gary Nolan we're trying to cover, for, uh, talking about UFO metamaterials, but this is a pressing issue. Let's jump back into the video and let's go ahead and see what Jake Sullivan had to say in today's White House pre press conference. Here we go. 
on FISA, there are a couple of amendments that are being considered. One of them would require a warrant for every query of lawfully collected data. If that were to pass and get into the bill, would the president veto that bill? Uh, so I'm not in a position to stand here today and make veto threats on behalf of the president. Those are, are um, you know, decisions for him to make. What I will tell this you... This may not be the right one. Let's see if I can find it from... Here we go. Congressman Mike Turner issued a statement saying that President Biden should declassify intelligence related to a, quote, serious national security threat. Um, what can you say about the threat and what the administration plans to do? So first, I reached out uh, earlier this week to the Gang of Eight uh, to offer myself for a, up for a personal briefing to the Gang of Eight. And in fact, we scheduled a briefing for the four House members of the Gang of Eight tomorrow. Uh, that's been on the books. So I am a bit surprised that Congressman Turner came out publicly today in advance of a meeting on the books for me to go sit with him alongside our intelligence and defense professionals tomorrow. That's his choice to do that. All I can tell you is that I'm focused on going to see him, sit with him, as well as the other House members of the Gang of Eight tomorrow. And I'm not in a position to say anything further from this podium at this time, other than to make the broad point that this administration has gone further uh, and in more creative, more strategic ways, dealt with the declass declassification of intelligence in the national interest of the United States than any administration in history. Or the declassification of intelligence in the president's garage. <laughs> uh, so you, you definitely are not going to find an unwillingness to do that when it's in our national security interest to do so. At the same time, we, of course, have to continue to prioritize and focus very much on the issue of sources and methods. We'll do that. Ultimately, these are decisions for the president to make. But in the meantime, the most important thing is we have the opportunity to sit in a classified setting and have the kind of conversation uh, with the House intelligence leadership that I, in fact, had scheduled before uh, Congressman Turner went out today. Yeah. But, but just to be clear, uh, Turner calls this an urgent matter with regard to a destabilizing foreign military capability. Are you aware that there is an emerging serious threat here that he's referring to? Again, I'll just say that I personally reached out to the Gang of Eight. It is highly unusual, in fact, for the National Security Advisor to do that. I did that uh, to set up a meeting. At the, the Senate's not here. The four House members have agreed to that meeting. This is well before Congressman Turner came out today. We'll have that conversation tomorrow. I'm not going to say anything but further today. That, that, that this is about the same thing? When you set up that meeting to reach out to them, were you intending to discuss this matter? Well, I, again, I'll, I'll leave it to you to <laughs> draw whatever connections you want. All I can say is I reached out to see Turner. Turner's gone out publicly. I'm going to go see Turner tomorrow. Uh, that's where I want to leave things for today. I reached out to see Turner saying, Mike, I need you to talk about this. Mike's like, okay, fine. We'll talk about it tomorrow. Hey, guess what, people? This shit's going on. We need to declassify this, which is good, which means whatever Jake Sullivan was wanting to bring forward to the Gang of Eight is so important. He thinks it's it needs to be spread beyond the Gang of Eight, but needs to be spread out to every single person in the House of Representatives and the Senate. That's an important, that, that is a very important point. Mike Suckloff, you have your hand up. It sounds to me like these guys are A, not communicating, and they're in disarray. What is going on down there? Sounds like our, our typical Congress, because you know what? There has been an announcement that so many committee leads in the House of Representatives are all freaking no longer going to run for re-election. They've had it. They've had it with the inability of Congress, the House of Representatives, to get stuff done. I think, what was it, Mike, six or eight people who announced that in that tweet I sent you today? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's like a, a tidal wave <laughs> of people that don't want to deal with this shit anymore. It's like the red tide is going out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Brian Pemble, your hand is up, my friend. Yeah, by the way, this was such an urgent national security threat that Mike Turner talked about it, and Jake saw, oh, it's been on the books for days. No, they don't. If it was that urgent, they'd be getting their butts into the skiff immediately. Oh, no, we had this meeting for days. That doesn't sound urgent, urgent, urgent to me. Doesn't um, sound right, does it, my friend? No, something's, something's not right in the state of Denmark. Yeah. So. <laughs> 
Absolutely. This is an evolving story. We will continue to cover this on Disclosure Tank because we cover more than UFOs. A lot of times we just focus on it, but we're not going away. We're not going to take the Leto out. We're not going to follow along with uh, all the other people who are fading out. We're here for the long run, and more importantly, we're here for everybody in the audience. You keep us going, my friends, and I want to thank everybody, all 307 people in the audience, for watching the show. More importantly, I'll say it one more time. Give us a thumbs up. Thanks. <laughs> Even if I'll piss off that one person saying, stop asking. I'll keep on asking because it helps us with the YouTube algorithm to go ahead and share our content on that matter. Let's get to the top story tonight, which we have been delayed in getting to at this point. Let's get into the conversation coming from Gary Nolan at the Soul Conference several months ago that took place at Stanford University. It's been a while to get the data there. Uh, we finally have the videos to come out. Let's go ahead and listen to Gary talking about the metamaterials and the analysis of it and what we're dealing with. This is probably one of the best pieces coming out of the Soul Conference. There's a lot more other ones out there we'll be covering on the days to come. But for that matter, let's go ahead and get to this video. Here we go. Let's get to the desktop video. Let's kick the play button and check it out. So again, I want to thank everybody for coming. I uh, really appreciate it. And um, I, I forgot this morning to mention Dave Grush. Uh, Dave can't be here because of travel that he's doing right now. But um, I want to remind everybody that he's, uh, you know, he was a partner in setting this up. Um, and we're proud to be associated with him, just so everybody knows. Um, and so Dave, if you're listening. <laughs> I have to say, Gary is one of the first presenters I see up there actually doing a presentation who doesn't have a MacBook. Boo! <laughs> so, what's inevitable? Inevitably, we're going to come across something out there that is uh, alien. I mean, let's just be serious about it. Um, or at least life, let's say. Um, but how do we engage it? And how do we begin? And so, you know, I think... We start with the problem is everything is made of stardust, right? So how do we approach this? Um, we don't understand the rules, frankly, of how it all goes together. You know, as a biologist, I study the basic gears and principles of what goes on inside of a cell, and then we basically figure out how it works, um, try to. Um, and so. I think of potential UAP materials as something that I can approach with the same methodologies that I have with uh, cancer research. It's straightforward. We just have to analyze it. But at what level do you analyze it? So, because we don't understand the rules of how it all goes together. And, you know, if you, if you think about uh, Avi's work with the meteor from 2014, um, which seems to have a structural integrity that defies you know, at least a good portion of the astrophysics community's desires. Um, and then you think about what Kevin spoke about. Obviously, somebody has an understanding of physics that we don't, but that means that they're putting things together in ways that we don't understand how they're doing it. So let's back up here. So technology invention, Stanford, and questions. From exobiology to Silicon Valley and biotech. So in the department where I got my PhD, uh, there was a gentleman by the name of Joshua Lederberg, and he'd got the Nobel Prize for uh, being the first to show how bacteria have sex. Um, and so uh, he was the chairman of the department, um, but he was interested in what's out there. And so he pioneered the field of exobiology with one of the first papers on the subject. Um, and then he started proposing the Viking project. Uh, and then uh, he was appointed oversight of that, and he helped design it. 
At the same time, he was, uh, he was recruiting other scientists uh, to the department, a couple of which I will talk about in a moment. So this is Leonard Herzenberg. Leonard was my PhD advisor, along with Lee Herzenberg. They were a husband-wife team. They were inseparable. Um, and he invented the fluorescence-activated cell sorter, which is a remarkable device uh, that allows you to separate cells based on fluorescence. And when you get a blood draw and you, something comes back and says you have this many CPCs or this many whatever, it's using this instrument. Um, and, but interestingly, he capitalized on the engineers who were still kind of, they, they sort of, they, they, Viking had been launched or was around, and, but he, they had this amazing expertise to design things at the micro scale. So he, he capitalized on that. Flow cytometry today, because of those patents, is a multi-billion dollar industry. It is the root of all immunology, and all of the things that I've done have frankly been replicating many of the things that, uh, that uh, Lee and Len have done, but at, at more expansive scales. Importantly, to get that technology out, right, I mean, there's like this big thing in academics, you know, socialism, capitalism, you know, it's free for everybody, it's whatever. So, but what Stanford realized, along with Niels Reimers, who was the uh, head of the Stanford Office of Technology Licensing, who with Bertram Rowland, they came up with a very unique patenting scheme that enabled access while not giving away the, the farm, literally. Also, in that department at the same time was Stanley Cohen. Uh, Stanley Cohen uh, was the, uh, basically the Cohen-Boyer patents that started the biotech industry. So I rotated with Stan, in fact I came to Stanford to work with him, and the, but I ended up being more interested in the stuff going on in Lens Lab. So $35 billion overall so far. Okay, and that, that was a lot of extra money to the Department of, uh, of Genetics. It was one of the richest departments on campus. Using the flow cytometer was this guy, Vernon Oy. He was my uh, lab mentor in, in Lens Lab. He was a postdoc, was more than that. He, again, had been an amazing inventor. So he, along with Len and others, uh, invented what are called humanized antibodies. And those humanized antibodies have gone on to revolutionize cancer uh, and autoimmune disease work. The impact there is in the trillions of dollars. Not just the sales of them, but trillions and the lives saved. Okay, so here you have a question, a simple question, that set off a chain reaction of opportunity, a synchronistic chain reaction, right people, right time, all in this one department because of the closeness of those people, right? And that proximity and access to information is what drives, it's the fuel of science. It's very important. So, and it all started with the question, are we alone, right? That, that started it. That is the reason all of this is here, right? So let's jump right into it. As you all know, I've been interested in alleged UAP materials. So how would you analyze materials from a UAP? Well, like I said before, it's you take it apart piece by piece, you try to understand the components, and you try to ask the question, why is this component here next to that component, and what might they be doing with each other? So, but it's not just about that. It was about that there's data out there that something unusual is observed, and the speakers this morning went over this, and the evidence is collected in a crime scene, and I got interested in it because of this. And so, but as it turned out, some of this evidence appeared to come from UAPs. Is it the steering wheel? Is it their version of a, of a you know, television screen? What is it? What did they leave behind and why did they leave it behind? Is the question. So how, how do we analyze it? So, I mean, I won't go into all of, the, of the, uh, this whole slide, but I mean, it's really about using the tools we already have, and I happen to have uh, laboratory tools that allow me to look at metals. Um, I'm not a metallurgist, but I play one on TV. Um, but it's, uh, I had the tools, and I had the interest, and I had a good friend by the name of Jacques Vallée, who brought me uh, some of these materials, because he said, hey, let's, uh, let's look at this. 
And I should say right up front, Jacques and Hal Putoff, Eric Davis, Colm Kelleher, uh, all those people uh, frankly rescued me from the, uh, the rabbit hole of ufology uh, because I was wandering and they said, here's, here's a guy who might be, he might, we might be able to work with him. So it's all about, and also functional analysis, just knowing what a thing, how it's made is not the same thing as knowing how it functions. So, but it needs that interdisciplinary team that what happened in the Department of Genetics. Okay, so how to do science right. Um, so where do we start? This is, that, that's who I see when I look in the mirror. <laughs> so where do we start? Let's get this show on the road. That's ChatGPT, I love it. Um, so the first case, and this is the case that we published uh, in uh, basically last year, and it was with Larry Lemke, uh, a, a postdoc of mine, and, um, uh, and uh, well, Jacques, sorry. And so, again, it's about the evidence. You can't just take anybody's claim that something is the truth. So this is one of the best and most uh, widely observed at the time uh, of cases. Um, multiple observers, et cetera, I won't go through them all, it's not necessary, but uh, you know, a hovering object, and then something seems to slough off and drop to the ground. And some people were like, they were literally only with about 500 or so feet from it. So the police, luckily, were called. Um, and uh, and here's, you know, here's one of the observers down here in red, another observer, another observer, and this is where they ran to. And what did they find? This is one of the actual original photographs. Um, we have them. Um, and uh, it's a big pool of metal that was in the process of cooling. Okay, so how did that, how did that get there? So, you know, they went through uh, all of the possible reasons it could get there from hoaxes through thermite, through a meteoric crash. I mean, who would think this is a meteor? It would have left a hole. Uh, um, space debris reentry, all of these things were dismissed. So, uh, but of course, it's just something sitting in the, in the literature. Um, and this is where we published that paper. Um, and just, you know, so there's always this question I get about reputational damage. So Sazun Jiang is on this paper. He's now a professor, assistant professor at Harvard and over in the medical school. Didn't hurt him. They fought for him. There's Sazun right there. So the first technology that we brought to this is the, one of the ones that was developed in my lab actually by Mike Angelo, who's here. Um, Michelangelo, reincarnation, and, and nobody is. I mean, when he showed up in my lab, uh, he was, I thought he was crazy because he was all excited about something that he thought we could do. And I thought, you know what? It sounds possible, so let's do it. So we took these materials. Uh, this was, we had a big chunk of this material. We took five different pieces of it, very small pieces, because these things require tiny amounts of material to study. Because you don't want to look at just one thing if you can. As long as, if it's, if it's relatively inexpensive, you want to look at multiple places. You want to, as we say when we're looking at the, uh, at the tumor immune interface, we want to sample the, we want to sample the ecosystem. So, took multiple things, just to make sure. So, you know, the first thing, as you all know, we went and looked at isotope ratios. We didn't find anything. They looked absolutely normal. Um, but I, I noticed something in these signatures and those are the metals that came out, is that the ratios of the elements were different from one to the other, right? So that means it was not homogenous. Somebody didn't put it in a blender and make a, you know, make a, a uniform distribution. I mean, if you're making a material for something and it is different in different places, uh, then you're gonna have structural issues where one part might be uh, less, or more bendy than another, or more likely to crack, et cetera. So that, that was interesting. That, that means when this stuff, when it was dumped there, however it was, but we'll take the word of the, because it's fun, right? I mean, uh, speculation ends up being a headline, Stanford professor says, Harvard professor says. You know, no, it's speculation. It's just a, a game to play in your mind. So you have these different ratios, which means that before it was dumped out, it was incompletely mixed. 
So what, what does that mean? How and why would you do that? Um, I mean, were you offloading something that was problematic? You know, we all heard the stories about how these things might wobble and then something happens, somebody, another one shows up and they fix it and then they, they go off merrily ever after. So, uh, and these were just the ratio. So Gary's talking about at this point of when there is a UFO, uh, some of these UFOs that are out there, um, when they're, I don't have a plate here to demonstrate this with, one of the UFOs that are out there, they'll be wobbling, and when they're in this wobbling state, they put out an, an ejaculate, an ejectile, that comes out of the particular craft that's molten metal that is unlike any metal that's on this planet at this point. And what Gary was saying is when one of those crafts will be there and it's wobbling, Another craft will come in there, help stabilize the other craft, and then they both go and take off. So that was just a little piece that uh, Gary was bringing up. I wanted to bring it to everyone's attention. Let's get back to this. Here we go. Uh, and, and there they are. So they're not slightly different. They're completely different, right? So depend everywhere you look, it's it's. I, I've explained it before, like you have chocolate and uh, vanilla ice cream along with strawberry, you let it melt, you give it a couple of twirls, and where you, where, wherever you look, there's gonna be a different ratio. So, but, so what can we conclude from this? It's clearly the result of an industrial process. It's not the machine, maybe it's exhaust, maybe, who, who knows, we don't know. Um, it had incomplete mixing of components, that's a conclusion, right? I always talk about data and conclusions, that you know, it's about the data, not the conclusion. Get another scientist to agree with the data, that the data is real, and now you get to ask them why the onus is not entirely on you, right? There's, there was no signs of any technology and no exotic isotope ratios. Okay, so... So what's cool here, what we're showing is that there's five samples from the same event that took place, and all five of the samples, Lee, have varying ratios so it's not like it's it's you know what this reminds me of this reminds me of something that was mixed up but not fully mixed before it was uh kicked out of the saucer your thoughts exactly um i love the fact that he's talking about incomplete mixtures yes and 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 it's a matter of a process which is what he's saying it's a manufacturing process and he says that's not hypothesis that is a conclusion that has been made um, that's an important statement that he made right there, that these materials that have been offloaded, dumped, trashed, whatever they are, it's an incomplete mixture, but it is a by-process of a manufacturing process that is a conclusion of understanding of what they're looking at. Right. So whatever it is, there's a bunch of different materials that are incomplete mixtures that are literally getting thrown out of this thing. That's why we're getting from the five samples that the United States government didn't get their hands on. <laughs> this is what they're learning. Let's continue. You know, can we look deeper? I mean, that's a pretty high, that's from, from, I mean, from a, you know, a structural analysis point of view, if I'm talking about atomic, you know, machines, this is like the 30,000 foot, but it's what was available at the time. And it, it wasn't really something that I had uh, thought about much, but then, you know, can we do this? Can we, see, can we see smaller? And why would we want to do that? Well, like with the immune system and cancer cells, the, the proximity of where one is relative to another actually predicts the outcome of the cancer and whether the therapy will work or not. So we went to this instrument. This is atomic probe tomography. And atomic probe tomography is a, actually a very well known and used technology, but it's expensive and there's only a few of them around. Um, but what it does is it literally takes the sample apart atom by atom, about a thousand atoms a second, and it figures out where the three dimensional, uh, it's three dimensional placement in that. So, so here's the, uh, here's the idea. You create an electric field, an electric field differential. You set it up so that you have, are evaporating the sample. And where it lands on the detector can be triangulated back to where it originated on the sample. And, so, and what do you get from that? You get a map of where things are. 
So there's, this is the world's, at least public, first uh, UAP alleged material uh, studied at the atomic level and collected at the atomic level. So this is uh, the Council Bluffs. It's a tiny, tiny thing. I mean, it's like, it's like uh, literally uh, two or three microns cubed, but there's millions of atoms in there. So, I mean, I knew that I wasn't going to find any structures, but this was an easy thing to start with. Uh, and then you look, at the, you look at the complexity of what's in there. So the first thing that, for instance, they were trying to explain this thing away as, as it was just industrial steel. Well, it's not industrial steel. Now, that we, now we literally have things that industrial steels don't normally contain. But now we can go in and look closer. So here, for instance, this is 3D. Now we're inside the structure. I've taken away the iron, which is so prevalent as to be, would obscure everything. Now we can see the position of where everything is, right? Again, this is just a trial, but now we get to see potential structure. So I would say that if we're going to study any of these other materials that seem to have novel properties, uh, this would be the way to do it. I had hoped to do the bismuth magnesium case uh, before I, well, we, we tried it, but it, it fell apart in the instrument under the stress of the... just want to point this out. This old person with the thick glasses who's right here, I believe that's Russell Targ from the uh, uh, SRI uh, remote viewing days. It looks like Russell from the back. I could be wrong, but I think that's who it is. Local forces, it was just too crumbly, unfortunately. There's a way to fix that, but we couldn't do it in time for this. Um, because that would have been cool. I think that would have got a bunch of us jumping up and down, but I'm going to do it anyway. It's coming. Um, so you can look at all the individual atoms. You can't really see it so much. So those are uh, the things that I showed you on the, on the other page. Those are the individual atoms. Um, uh, oh, sorry, individual elements. Uh, there's some hints of uh, potential differences here. Um, but it's such early stages that um, I don't dare repeat, I, I don't dare say it until I repeat it. There's a lo lot more, I, I'm not an expert yet in APT, but I will be, um, you know, in this. And by the way, this was, uh, so the individual who's been helping me is uh, Alex Bolton. You've seen him around. So uh, he actually helped create uh, all this analysis and because we just got the data Friday. And while I was busy frantically dealing with Stanford administrative messes, um, he, he basically saved my bacon on that. But there's data, right? Now this is data. Um, material shows no sign of technology. The material is clearly the result of an industrial process, and it was incompletely mixed. OK, so why? I, again, that's the, that's the question you ask all the time when you see data. It's like, why? why? Why would you do it? What could have generated it? And why would you dump it in the middle of a field in a small farming town in Iowa? I don't know. I don't know the answers. OK, so that's one case. There's another famous case, Ubatuba. 1950s is a primary witness, but we don't have it. Never, nobody ever had access to the primary witness, but a Brazilian journalist who received the evidence uh, and again, through uh, the offices of, of Jacques, I was able to get access to some of this stuff. Um, and it, th this is actually what I don't quite understand is because, as you'll see from the result, it was claimed to be pure magnesium. Uh, wh what I was given was not magnesium. So, but we have two things called Moistra A and Moistra B, and that's Spanish for sample, I think somebody said, um, told me. And then this is the instrument that we used, highly accurate mass spectrometer. This looks like something that would be in the garage of Patrick Fogarty, who we missed today. But let's continue on. Um, and just, you know, this is how, this is the beginning of sort of how science is done. You, you don't want to measure different things on different days because you want the experiment to be done under the most similar conditions that you can. So those samples, two examples of each of those samples, along with a, a zoo of other things that, that Jacques happened to have, 
um, were put on this, and then we did the analysis. And I remember sitting there when they, when we, they printed out the data, and I was like, I don't understand this. I mean, I hoped that something like this would happen, but I never understood it. Um, I still don't. So one of the samples, claimed samples, has a, you know, pretty much exactly the natural thing. We had two, sh you know, two shards of each. The other one was way off. Way off. I mean, just no doubt. Um, okay, so why? 1950s, isotopes. If you mentioned isotopes to a 1950s crowd, they'd duck and cover, right? Because isotopes, and still, humans use, the, like one of the most important things we do is we make nuclear bombs out of them. Um, of course, they're used uh, in other, for medical purposes and tracing. Um, but we don't have... Which I believe is correct. That would take isotopes of what things are being built from and classifies all the information under the Atomic, Ener the Atomic Energy Act of 1954, basically taking all that information and making it all classified, right, Lee? That's exactly right. So any research that was being done on this, even leading up and prior to what Gary got with his instrumentation and what he's doing in Stanford, um, odds are this has already been calculated. And it's already been sequestered underneath the Atomic Energy Act. Yes. Right. So any results that have came from the United States government analyzing this stuff would say we can't release it. It's part of the national, uh, the Nuclear Energy Act. Let's push it to the side. Public doesn't need to know about it. They can do their research on it. But when we have Gary Nolan and his team doing the research on it, they can bring the information out, and that's where it gets interesting. Exactly. Here we go. Any chemical or material reasons to use them. So, okay, so what's, what's going on? So one had not, why well, change the isotope ratios? Back then, it was extraordinarily expensive to do these kinds of separations. It's still expensive. I mean, my lab orders extremely small amounts of different isotopes uh, from the uh, periodic, from the, the lanthanide series, because we use them as tags in our biology experiments, because each of them is unique. Um, so, for the uninitiated, what are isotopes? Again, this is, thank you, ChatGPT, and it made some things up, of course. But, you know, um, the, the idea here is, you know, humans work with elements. But somebody is playing with isotopes, so why would you play with isotopes? Because they're supposed to be the same. That's what I was taught in chemistry. Well, it turns out that's wrong. Now, people are starting to look at isotopes because you have an extra neutron in the element, and that changes the electronic configuration of the, of the orbitals just slightly. And so, in the right circumstances, having that difference would be sufficient to make a better catalyst. And so people, pharmaceutical companies and others, are starting to use this, starting to understand that, hey, there's something interesting here. Silicon, some of the uh, isotopes of silicon make better qubit holders that last longer than others, than the other three. Okay, so there it is. I mean, it's, it's there. Plants use it. Actually, it's, it's really fascinating. Um, so there's something yet to be understood. Okay, so this was the first time that I had gone beyond just magnesium, uh, looking at the ubatuba material. And even though we, we looked at the magnesium, because that instrument that I just showed you can see down to the parts per million, um, we were looking at that level. When I looked at this, it was almost entirely pure silicon. Okay, well, what's the natural state of silicon? Uh, sand, silicon oxide, quartz, things like that. Um, it doesn't come prepackaged as 99.999395. Yeah, you just don't get it. So why is somebody tossing that level of purity around? Because uh, again, it would be, that would be expensive to make. Um, so why would, you, why would you do it? So again, we go in and we're collecting this data. And by the way, I'm showing all of this because all of this will be going eventually on the web and I wanna do this with every material that I can get my hands on legally. Like, I'll be like Lou and, and Chris sneaking something out the back. <laughs> but they weren't. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm just...
Chris is going to kill me. Um, good. Um, and so again, look at the look at the numbers there of the percent. There's lots of other things in there, but the vast majority is silicon. The reason why it shows as lower is because I broke it down into the silicon um, uh, isotopes, and they're they're natural levels. So here again is the 3D, where we can go inside, and you know. So one of the next things to do is to say. Well, is there, uh, is there any sort of strange placement of the atom? So those are the three uh, nucleotides. Uh, and is there a likelihood for one thing to be near another? And that's what we do, again, in immunology. We look for certain cell types that are more or less likely to associate with each other. And that tells you that, huh, if that happened above statistical chance, then there's probably a reason for it. Things don't happen, usually in biology, by coincidence. Um, the two samples are pretty much within statistical certainty to be similar to each other. So that's interesting. Um, so even though they came from separate chains of custody, uh, there's enough data here, at least, to say that whoever prepared this stuff uh, either had identical preparation techniques or it came and it was broken and given into two chains of custody. Again, it's data. No sign of technology, but certainly signs of an industrial process. And that's important. So, I, I mean, I, and I'm, I'm saying this thing about the silicon. If anybody can tell me why pure silicon should be thrown around a beach in, you know, Brazil, I want to hear it, you know. Um, so the material is clearly a result of an industrial process. It wasn't found randomly. Nobody found it on the side of a road was associated with an event. And that's important here. And uh, because that coincidence, it doesn't prove that it's anything, but it, pr it, but it makes it, to me, more interesting. Unusual levels of pure silicon with contaminants. So again, what, what would you do? So the, the, the event was somebody saw something with, supposedly with lights, and then it dropped something which exploded. Okay. Why? Right? What, why? What, what's going on? I don't understand. Um, because on the one hand, we have these metals that drop. I have, an, I have another sample of something from Australia. Uh, there's a couple of other, a couple of other uh, events um, that actually are dropping molten objects. So there's a reason to offload something. Again, I'm speculating. There's a reason to offload something, but every time they do it, it, it ends up being slightly different. So does that tell you that there's many ways to achieve a similar goal? Right, so that's kind of you know, sort of back engineering the thought process of why would, you, why would you do something like this? So here's another case, very famous case, Socorro. Again, this is something from, from Jacques. Uh, on an Indian reservation, the uh, police officer was, in, was an Indian, was Indian. Um, he's driving along, uh, he hears a noise, he sees something, a shiny object in a field. He observes little people outside of the object. The object takes off kind of with a burst of flame. Um, you know, and of course, when people tried to debunk it, he's, they said he, he saw the star something or other. You know, he's a, he's a trained observer. He's a policeman, right? So um, he didn't want to talk about it, so he wasn't seeking publicity. He just did it. So, I, so Jacques had a piece. He gave it to me. Um, and... <coughs> You know, again, we take an electron microscopy. Everything looks like it's, you know, from another planet uh, under, uh, under an electron microscope. Um, very simple. Aluminum, zinc, mostly, and some contaminants. But the aluminum and the zinc are in different places. So this is at a, a, a distance. So there it is. So there's the aluminum on the top, there's the zinc on the bottom, or vice versa. No, zinc is, zinc's the green, yes. But it's, it's differently distributed. It's the contaminants that are interesting. That's what I'm interested in. Because they're kind of a signature. Is, are they uniformly distributed? 
throughout the thing, meaning, or, or are they somehow next to each other? So we looked at that. So now, if I look in the aluminum on the top, again, it's incredibly pure. It has like a single oxygen molecule. I just want to bring this up really quick. There's some interesting conversation going on in the chat. The uh, UFOs going ahead and dropping an, uh, some kind of ejectile coming out of the craft kind of reminds me of Star Trek when they have to go ahead and eject the core before it goes critical, We're talking about their warp engine. And it's something we're not sure why, but it's something that's happened in Brazil. It's happened in several places in the U.S. It's a global phenomenon. It's even happened in Wisconsin back in the day where some of this ejectile came down on a... Uh, on a fishing boat, set it on fire, but also came down in a tree that they went and pulled the material out of. So this is something that's gone on time and time again. You may want to know chain of custody on this, but the reality is, irrespective of the chain of custody, the material that's being discussed, if we tried to go ahead and recreate this on our planet today for creating a block of something that would be a millimeter by a millimeter square, it would cost billions of dollars and takes over take over 10 years for us to produce. So keep that in mind when you're hearing Gary talking about this. It's a very important piece. It's a million. I don't know who does that and why would you do it? It's attached to a zinc thing underneath which has some aluminum in it but look at how it's non-uniformly distributed, right? There's like a cluster of it over here. Is that because they have a junky recipe? They didn't mix it right? It just is, but why? Don't know. Again, this case, I mean, this is clear, clear sign of engineering. I mean, the interface between those things is, is like exact down to the atom, including the result of an industrial process. So this, of course, is not the only way to look at atoms or looking at materials at an ultra high resolution. There's many other of these kinds of devices uh, that do different things, but none of them have the uh, exactitude that an, an APT has because uh, they provide at the five or so angstrom scale, and they're getting better. Um, and so I won't go into all of the others, but why, why do I show a table like that? Um, because we're actually starting a new initiative, uh, Starbus, Stardust Repository, taking a page from Avi. Everything is made of Stardust, setting up standardized testing, so basically creating a federation of other scientists to whom we can go and pass the material along because doing all the things you want to do would cost a bazillion dollars. So you have to have other people doing it more or less for free um, or at least at, at cost. Uh, I mean, by the way, that thing that I, all those things I showed you, that was $40,000 to do that at a service center down in San Jose that does it and uses it for microelectronics. Deep vetting, make sure we're, no one's sending us junk. Uh, and again, it's, it's about, I can't look at everything and know the answers, but I want to get the data out there so everybody can. Maybe somebody will, will do it. Maybe my nephew here, who's interested in science, will do it. Um, I'll help him. <laughs> so, uh, organized under a public umbrella operation. Maybe that might induce somebody who has something claimed on the inside to bring it out and say, hey, why don't you help us with this, right? And actually, Avi did exactly this with the materials that they brought back from um, the South Pacific, you know, sending it around to other people. But now I, I, I want to standardize it and give other people, they don't ha other people don't need to participate in what we're doing, but I want to put out sets of protocols by which other people can do it so they don't have to reinvent the wheel. So, you know, funded by gifts or grants. Help, please. Um, and, uh, you know, the data freely available. But, I mean, we do want to also respect, and this is the biology community has gone through this at great depth, uh, where um, you get these big consortia, you collect the data, everybody's freaking out because they want to write the paper. 
Um, and so you've got to give them time to write the paper. Uh, but there's, all, there's at the end of it, uh, the deadline says, you know, we, we, public, we put it out there publicly um, after uh, one or two years. And that's fine because, frankly, collecting the data is the easy part. Understanding it's the hard part. You know, we spend months with bioinformatics and thinking about it, trying to figure it out. So, you know, I, I'm imagining now 30 years from now, and this is my warehouse. Uh, where I've collected all of these materials, and actually we've used some of them to help analyze those materials. Hey Lee, you have your hand up, my friend. I just want to add, like, I, I love that he's dedicated his life to this and that he has found a cross-congruence between biological and cancer research and metamaterial research. And um, I think that little bit is lost on people that he didn't start out researching metamaterials. He started out in immunology and uh, cancer research. And he's found a, a collective understanding between metamaterial research and cancer research that has led him down this rabbit hole, so to speak, that he's claimed that Jacques Vallée and, and his counterparts have saved him from um, to bring him back around to the um, understood properties of the science of what they're talking about. So he went into this not to be a UAP or UFO researcher. He was researching cancer and, and, and immunology. And um, through that process, through the, through the machines that he has uh, patented and devised, um, people have come to him and said, hey, by the way, uh, take a look at this too. Because on our atomic structure, we think there might be some insight that you can give to this for us. And um, it's kind of like he's the double decker. He's like he's like the best um, non UFO UAP researcher that exists in the field because what he cares about just happens to splash into UAP and um, and these things. And uh, I just I love him because he's he's yeah. he's absolutely I love him because he's yeah. he's matter of fact and he's talking about the science of it. Yeah. And, and um, yeah, we're talking about the science of stuff. Lee, that we're dealing with materials that are clearly not on from human creation, right? We're talking about materials that have a certain structure to them that goes beyond any capability of what humans could possibly have to go ahead and create these, right? Yeah, exactly. I love how he breaks it down and he breaks down the 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 uh, the micron spectrometry of um, pure um, aluminum and uh, you know magnesium and these things. And he's like, no, they're not behaving the way they should. Um, this is a manufacturing process. I don't understand who's manufacturing or how they're doing it, but these things don't normally behave this way when they're mixed this way. So this is when he keeps saying incomplete mixtures. He's talking about a manufacturing process that is kind of like the devil's cookbook that's going on with this kind of stuff. It's alchemy and they yeah. don't quite understand it. And he wants to know like what's going on here. Yeah. And I, just, I love it because he's being very transparent and very um, open about his research that is actually based off of a different parallel research that never even led him to this point. They're coming to him saying, we think we need to use your data. We need to use your instrumentation to help us solve this problem. And he's like, yeah, sure, I'll try. I'll, I'll, I'll try to figure it out for you. Um, I'm not gonna publish anything and make any bold claims, but um, I'll give you the data that I get off of what I've already built my patents and my time into, and we'll see where it goes. And I love him for that. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Great conversation all the way around. For Dr. Feelgood, if you don't like us going ahead and pausing, you can go ahead and find these videos someplace else. We're just going ahead and trying to comment on the conversation as we're going through it. And that's what we've been doing here at Disclosure tonight for well over two years. So if you haven't figured that out yet, well, <laughs> sorry, buddy. Uh, you maybe need to find another place to watch this stuff because we are here about explaining it and talking about it. Yes, he could be a troll, my friend, as we watch it. And that's a common thing that we've been doing here for the longest time. Let's continue. Right? Is there a discovery to be made? So uh, this, I think, is an important endeavor. I can't do it all. I'm not a metallurgist. But I think there's lots of, I get now, increasing numbers of emails from people saying, how can I help? I'm getting the sign. I'm done. 
Thank you. Well, there we go. Great conversation coming in from uh, Dr. Gary Nolan on this particular one. Great week. I was glad we could go ahead and share this. Lee, what are your takeaways on this one? It looks like Gary's got some really great info going on here that he's trying to share and show. The kind of materials that we're getting are not from humanity. They're put together in a way that we don't have the technology to go ahead and put together. So why are we all fools? If we don't have the exact chain of custody that you want to see, maybe you need to go ahead and search on the internet or email Gary Nolan yourself to go ahead and find out where. What we're trying to talk about is the materials that we're dealing with here go beyond the science and the capabilities of humanity today, 2024, period. We can't yep. recreate this stuff. If we wanted to, there's no there's no chance of us getting there. So on that note, Brian Pemble, you have your hand up, my friend. Yeah, I got a hand to Gary. I'm with Lee. I love the guy. This is spectacular. You associate it with the craft, you know, whether it's it's a byproduct of what the craft's doing or whether it's a gift. Either way, you get it, you analyze it, you show the results. Gary is bringing the receipts 100% and good on him. Yeah. Absolutely. And, it, and, you know, a lot of materials, the material, I believe, with the last one he was talking about coming from Brazil, that's from the 50s. <laughs> you know, this stuff has been hanging around. It's been going from person to person, but it's getting to the right person today so we can start looking at some of these samples and analyzing them and figure it out. Is this something that Sean Kirkpatrick would love? Is it prosaic? Or is it not prosaic? That's what we should be looking at. And from what we're seeing, the samples that we have here coming across that Gary Nolan is talking about are not prosaic. And we're talking about stuff that is not possible from humanity. Exactly. exactly With right. our best we technologies. We create those metals. Yes. And, and, and the good news about this, this is only going to encourage, if you notice at the very end, it's only going to encourage more scientists to get involved in this. The, the, the roller coaster is already peaked. The Gary brought it up to the top, and it's just going to roll downhill from here. So, who knows to Gary Nolan? I'm a giant fan. Yeah, absolutely. But here's what's interesting about the points that Gary was making. Now, I don't know if anybody caught. He was talking about silicon, which is sand. And what he said was, when it went through the mass spectrometer, <laughs> that when you find naturally occurring sand here on this planet, it is not pure, pure to the level of 99.935. It's not naturally occurring at that purity level. You and mean I can't go to Hawaii to the, black, to the black sand beach or to the white sand beach or go to the islands of Samoa or go to Japan or anywhere down in Argentina or anywhere? I'm not going to be able to find sand like this anywhere in the world, right, Mike? You're not going to find it doesn't exist at that level. No, it's not naturally occurring here on this planet, which is why he said that the conclusion is that it had to have been manufactured, not by us, but it was a result of manufacturing to get that degree of pure silicon. Yeah. And all the other elements you mentioned, aluminum as well. It's at a purity level that's not naturally occurring. And the most important part unusual. of these samples are these elements that we have that come from the periodic table of elements are not made from the elements themselves. These things are off from the atomic structure that we have. These elements are being made from isotopes, completely different method of putting these elements together. Again, that shows the samples we're talking about is not from this planet. Well, it could be, but more it has more a more greater chance of being created on the moon because most of these metals and everything else are put together in a structure that points to these things were created in a method of zero gravity, right? Yeah, but here's the thing. The the natural elements and the isotopes are found here on this planet, but how they're manufactured, not by us. Yeah. That's the conclusion. Yeah. It's a Lee great con hand, It's a great conversation. Who does? Go ahead. I think it's important to talk about what he was talking about in the 1950s in Brazil with the pure silicate that was um, put on the beach. In 1950, it, so he said it cost $40,000 to Take run the mic. This 
it, it ahead, costs 40, it costs yeah, 40, I got it. Dollars to run this simple experiment in 2020, 2023, 2020, whatever it was. How much do you think that would have cost? And was there act, an actual cost or ability to run that experiment in 1950? Um, so what Gary's talking is, is that it's not that it can't be manufactured here. It's that the other the other factors that are involved with manufacturing this simply were not present at that time when the sample was procured. Um, so you have to suspend your belief if you want to act as if this is a human made um, isotope. What it means is you actually have to do the math and understand in 1950, if they were going to generate that pure silicate and expel it off the beach of Brazil, what was the cost of that? And this was the waste apparently that they were expelling off of this observation, which is cataloged and understood. So basically what he's saying is it would have been to the order of trillions of dollars in 1950 to actually even create the waste that was dropped off the observation. So how did the manufacturing process in 1950 have the actual ability to fund that at that time? That's what that's what Gary's talking about. It was not humanly possible to manu manufacture that at that time. It's very expensive now. It was impossible then. That's what he's talking about. Yeah. Great points, Lee. You know, it's just one of those things we're going to keep on digging into this. We're never going to stop, get there. While a lot of other UFO shows keep on dropping off the radar, we're here and we'll keep the drums of war beating because we haven't got, uh, we haven't uh, gotten the answers we're looking for. Well, in late breaking UFO news, yes, we have, do have a UFOs alert that came out. Apparently, Lou Elizondo was seen, or he was actually meeting with Representative Eric Burleson today. Have you heard about that yet, Mike? No, I haven't, but that is very, very interesting. I wonder what's going to come out of that. I don't know, but it's something that's interesting. We know Eric Burleson is one of the people who is supporting disclosure. Uh, anytime people are meeting with Lou, Lou's coming out of the shadows to meet with people. That's a great uh, late-breaking story, and hopefully we'll have some more information on that for our show coming up later this week. Oh, without a doubt. Yeah. Now, Mike, I think we do have a special guest coming on here, a surprise guest coming in on Friday, don't we? Friday. F refresh my memory. Mr. Uh, oh, God. Name ends with a ski. <laughs> um, Rick's friend. Oh, yes. Yes, he's supposed to. Oh, um, the cat. Uh, the not, not Lekowski. Lekowski. That's where my mind was going, but it's not That's Lekowski. where my head is, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Lekowski. Yeah, yeah. No. Lekowski, yeah. Lekowski. Gene. Uh, Gene. Gene Lekowski. Who's been in our audience. So, wasn't yeah. he like a 15 or 17-year employee at Area 51? He was. Yeah. And he was high up in the, uh, in the, in the um, intelligence community. So, yeah. Yeah. He's, we also have a surprise person. guest coming on our Saturday show as well. Thanks to Mike Morris. Appreciate that. Yeah, this is the guy we've got coming on by the name of Alan, who was actually one of the people who, were, who was working on uh, refurbishment of the uh, bicentennial train that was going across the United States that during the Carter administration, they were going to take that to bring out the dead bodies of the UFOs and parts of the crash retrievals, take them across the United States to go ahead and bring out the truth about UFOs because sometimes when you have something as big as UFOs, you need to go ahead and bring out the proof, the proof for the people to come and see the facts. Right, Mike? Oh, absolutely. That sounds like we're going to have one hell of a conversation on Saturday. with. Him. Oh, we got one on Friday, one on Saturday. We'll just have to see if I can keep the show going tomorrow. If I have enough energy, we might just have to come back because we still haven't gotten through all these videos from the soul Con uh, conference. It was, uh, you know, there's so many great things for us to discuss, you know? Yeah. Show us the bodies. You better believe it. My friend. I also reached out to Matt Laszlo to try to get him to come on the show and discuss what's going on with us. But because of the emergency sessions going on in the Congress, he's tied up at the yeah. moment. He spent 17 hours a day in Congress. Wow. 
That is a so, guy who is, you know, he. I, I like to look him at as our one of our uh, Washington correspondents going out and actually bringing the truth out and asking the tough questions. Oh, he's embedded. Kelly, we might have a show tomorrow. You never know. He's embedded in the Congress. It's almost like he lives there. You should pull up a cot. Yeah. <laughs> or or so. sleeping in one of the stalls in the bathrooms. <laughs> <laughs> Something oh, like my. that. Oh, my but God, what a great show, what a great opportunity on. to hang out with an audience. Mike, is there anything we haven't covered yet today? No, I think we're all good. It's Valentine's Day. Um, everybody should enjoy the rest of what's left. And um, we had one hell of a show tonight. It was oh, fun. You know, I actually, I've got a message from Nick Madrid. We're going to have to cover tomorrow. A new post on Facebook from a Dr. Eric W. Davis. And the contents of his classified complaint contain direct first have evidence from David Grush's security investigations that discovered the existence of the legacy UAP crash retrieval programs. We'll cover that at the start of tomorrow's show. I'm looking forward to that one, Mike. Oh, that's going to be breaking news. I can't wait. I know. It's in my inbox. I didn't get to it today because we've had so many things to cover. Can only cover so many things, but you know what? I want to go ahead and thank everybody for coming out. What a great show. What a great opportunity to hang out with our audience. Thank you much, everybody, for coming out here tonight. It would not be the same without you. More importantly, I want to go ahead and find this, and let's go ahead. And thank everybody for your wonderful Super Chats tonight. It wouldn't be the same without your support of Disclosure tonight. It helps keep the lights on. It helps keep me occupied on keeping the show going. Who am I talking about? I want to go ahead and thank, turn off the chat right now. I want to thank Chameleon UK, Baba200, Necessary Dialogue. And the first chat of the night goes to Faze Will. Thank you very much, Faze Will. Appreciate your ongoing love and support and your participation in the back chat. It wouldn't be the same without you, my friend. Absolutely remember that every dollar that comes into Disclosure tonight goes back into our production fund. I am personally so humbled and thankful from everyone's support of the show, not just in Super Chats, but the participation in the chat because the chat is where it's at. More importantly, I want to thank our friends who are still in the chat right now. Who do we still have out there? Let's go ahead and take a look. Who are the participants that are still there right now? I want to thank Andrew Donnelly, actually, Abby Araxa, Amiga Rules, Andrew, Senior TV, Attorney to the EBEs, Bushlight, Casey's been here, Charles Kerr, David Williams, Dr. Tim Taylor, all the way from the great country of Taiwan. If he's still there, he could be in the United States. You never know. Eli McGinnis, Firefly, Jack Carr, Jason Brown, J Cat, Kathy, Kelly Barot, those piercing blue eyes. Mick Mick has been around along with Morgan, Paul DeMond, Peggy with Crockett and Tubbs, and Steve. Can't forget Steve. Pete Liebel, Rachel Osborne, Resonate's been here. Rough Ready. Rough, rough. <laughs> Skip to Malou, Terrence Wills, Thor Panku, Tooth Seeker, Watch and Vids, and Why Oh Why Oh Fools, who I've been poking you all night just to have some fun. You actually got some time to go ahead and play with the chat a little bit tonight. It's been a while. On that note, I also want to go ahead and thank it's not just about the people who have been in the chat. It's also about the people who are in the back. On that note, I want to go ahead and thank the people who have been part of this conversation tonight, bringing up some great questions and things to say. That would include Brian Pemble. Thanks for coming out tonight, Brian. Absolutely. Great show. Wouldn't miss it. Thank you, sir. Also want to thank LM. Thanks for coming out tonight, Lee. No, Thomas, I appreciate it always. Thank you for the platform. And everybody, Gary Nolan is going to deliver us some kind of scientific understanding and truth with these isotopes that uh, is going to open up the entire scientific community to a whole new paradigm. I certainly hope so, my friend. I certainly hope so. Then let's go next to Michael Suckloff. Thanks for coming out tonight, Michael. Anytime, Thomas. Anytime. You better believe it. Ms. Cussell, thank you for being here, my dear lady. Oh, thank you for having me. It was a great show tonight. Thank you very much. Neil Carr interested. from the great state of Oregon. Thanks for coming out, my friend. You helped get rid of the boring part of Oregon. <laughs> Yeah, my pleasure. It's a good show tonight. Absolutely. Let's take us next to Syrup. Thanks for coming out tonight, Syrup. No, uh, thank you, Thomas. It was a good show today. I must and, chill in the back uh, and ask some more questions. Absolutely, my dear friend. Also, that takes us back to Tia Maria Loreno. Thanks for coming out tonight, Tia. Thank you for having me, Thomas. It was a wonderful show. I loved it. Absolutely. And that gets us. 
And that gets us back to our friend Mike, Mike, Mike. Disclosure. Thanks for coming out tonight, Mike. Oh, it was a uh, a very fun Wednesday hump day Valentine's Day episode. Everybody enjoyed it. We had fun and we have more to come. So for all and for all the other people who are in the doghouse for be- <laughs> for being on this stream versus being part of Valentine's Day, welcome to my world. <laughs> And as we and as we usually say at the end of every episode of Disclosure tonight, eyes open, no fear, be safe, everyone. But go back to Party City where you belong. Absolutely, we'll catch you on the flip side. Good night, everybody. Love you. Talk to you soon. Y'all come back now. Here.